journalist. Um, I was a staff writer for The Guardian newspaper for 14 years. Um, I've recently gone freelance, so I'm now writing across the board. And the story that I'm going to tell you today is about my journey back to Eritrea to meet my birth family, which um, at the end of that story, I wrote, I wrote my book. So I'll do a little reading at the end from the book. But first, I'm going to tell you a bit more about the journey itself. I was born in Eritrea um, in 1974. I was um, born in a small village outside Keren, which is kind of the second or third um, city in Eritrea. And uh, when, my mother when, my, when I was born, um, my mother died in childbirth. And about, um, well, so, but I was still with the family. But not long after my mother died, um, my father, who was left with obviously myself, and also five other children to look after, and um, he's a farmer, he basically couldn't cope. And so it was decided by the family that I would be sent to an orphanage. So I spent the, um, the first six months of my life in an orphanage in Asmara, the Comboni mission in Asmara, for those of you that know Eritrea. Um, and um, when I was six months old, I was adopted from this orphanage by a white couple my adoptive mother was American and my father English. I know what you're thinking, it wasn't Madonna on an early mission. <laughs> uh, they were very ahead of their time. Um, <laughs> my new parents took me to live with them in Sudan where they were teaching at the University of Khartoum. And so for the first four years, that's where I lived. When I was four years old, my adoptive mother died. And as a result of this, I um, went to stay with another family who were living, who were sort of friends. And um, they decided to go back to their home country. And so I went with them. Their home country was Norway. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I went to live in Norway for a couple of years. And then, just before I was seven, my, um, my dad basically sent for me, my, my new dad sent for me, and I joined him in the UK. So I came to the UK just before my seventh birthday. I spoke Norwegian. Um, I was living in Manchester. When I talked to, um, I have one or two friends who still remember me when I joined the school in, um, in Manchester. And I say to them, what, what, like, what must you have thought, you know, this strange little black girl arriving in, um, in Manchester with speaking Norwegian? Like, what, how weird? <laughs> and, um, and one of my friends says, um, well, we just thought you were speaking some weird African language. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so, um, so from the ages of about seven until I would say 19, I lived a fairly typical um, English child's life, apart from the fact, obviously, that I was a black girl in a white family. Um, it was a white town. It was a white school. Um, so that was my day to day, if you like. In 1991, Eritrea won independence from Ethiopia. And as part of the celebrations in 93, my dad went back to Eritrea. He had been a long-time supporter of the EPLF um, and was one of the many people invited back for the independent celebrations. He went back to Eritrea, and um, as part of that journey back, he visited the orphanage that they got me from. And then he came back to England and told me all about it. And we didn't really think much more of it. Until uh, a few months later, we, well, I received a letter my dad received a letter via various people. And in the letter were two bits of very crucial information. The letter was from somebody who said he was my brother. And the letter carried the piece of information that my birth father was actually still alive. There was a third element to this letter that was also um, mind-blowing from my point of view. And that was a photograph of the sender of my brother. And so by this point, I was nearly 20. And it was the first time I'd seen a photograph of anybody with my DNA. This letter and the photograph that came with it were a huge shock for me. I'd always been told that when my family adopted me, one of the reasons they chose me was because I had no family. I was an orphan. So they were adopting an orphan with no ties, no family. And then suddenly it transpired that that actually wasn't the case. I had not just distant aunties or uncles, my father was still alive. I had brothers, a sister. This news sent me into what I can only describe as a, a shock, really, a deep emotional shock. And I didn't know what to do with it for a very long time. And so really, I, I put it away. I put the letter back in the envelope. I put the envelope in a box. I put the box under my bed. 
And I kind of ignored it. Every so often I would take it out, maybe birthdays, Christmas, when I was feeling a little bit um, like something was missing. I would have a look at the letter and try and see um, in the photograph if I looked the same as my brother and all those sorts of things. And then eventually, the, the desire to look at the letter and to find out what the story behind the letter was became so overwhelming that I couldn't resist it any longer. And so I decided it's time to go back to Eritrea and to find my birth family. One of the biggest hurdles with this decision was that it had actually been 10 years since I got the first letter. And so I had to get over the fact that there was a very real possibility that my father could have died in the time it took me to get used to the idea that he even existed. But like I say, eventually I decided that I had to go and find him. So I announced that I was going to go to, back to Eritrea, find my birth family. And from deciding to go, it was about a month before I was actually there. It was all done very, very quickly. Um, I was very lucky and sort of logistics worked out very quickly. And it was relatively easy. And so I went back to, um, to the country that I'd been born in just before my 29th birthday. When I arrived in Eritrea, one of the first things I noticed was it was the first time I'd been somewhere where I looked the same as everybody else. Um, this was a huge, huge thing for me. And I was really excited about looking like everybody else. Um, so we're just going to... So this is me having arrived in Eritrea. Now, when I look at this picture now, actually, I look like a tourist. <laughs> <laughs> but then I thought, wow, I look so Eritrean. <laughs> um, so we, I, I, had a, I had a couple of days, a bit like a tourist, really, in Eritrea, just trying to... Um, get used to the place. And then I met my birth family relatively quickly, actually, a lot quicker than I thought I was going to. And, um, and then it, it was, you know, the, the meeting was utterly mind-blowing and from, you know, something that will stay with me forever and which has changed my life forever. There's before I met them and now there's after I've met them. And it's, com it's just completely um, changed me on a very, very deep personal level. However, a couple of days after I met them, my father had gone back to his village, my sister had gone back to her village, and I, started, I hit a bit of a slump after the euphoria, really, of, of that big meeting. I hit this slump, and I decided that what I really wanted to do was to see more of my father and to see where my father lived, to go to my father's house. And so um, we decided my brothers, two of my brothers, one of my brothers lives in the capital and another one lives in Karen, and we decided to go to my father's village. So this is um, me waiting in the bus queue in Buruntu. <laughs> um, I like this picture because it's the beginnings of me looking a little bit more Eritrean and a little bit less like a tourist. Um, so we made the bus journey to my father's village. We broke it up into two days, stopping off at my brother's first and then um, going to the village. And it was a fairly uneventful um, African bus journey. Broken bus, burst tyres, <laughs> checkpoints. <laughs> Um, I loved every minute of it, but as I got nearer to my father's village, I did realise that I was um, experiencing a lot of fear. I was very fearful um, of the villages because all I'd seen, all I'd read, all I'd heard for a long time was about the poverty, about the devastation, about the war of Africa, and in particular, the villages. The only images I'd really seen on TV screens were incredibly negative, and so I was very um, apprehensive of going to the villages. But I, um, I went to my father's village, and um, this is me uh, with my father. My father is um, the guy in the hat <laughs> um, in the middle. And we are there with my... After my um, mother died, my father remarried. And so the woman next to me is his um, second wife and my half-brothers and sisters. And then we also... My, my brother lives... One of my brothers lives um, just up the path, really. So we went to go and visit him as well. So this is my brother... Stefanos, um, with his wife and children. I had a very interesting experience with, with the children. I, um, especially Nardos, who's the one I'm holding, who I held for about three days solidly, <laughs> um, because I actually found myself experiencing feelings of envy, really, um, because although their, their lives in many ways are very, very tough, and there is no denying that, um, they were with the family. And if, you, if things are good, um, there's nothing like that kind of a family, if things are good, basically. But then I went back to Asmara and realised that I'd spent a lot of time with the men in my family. And really, I wanted to learn more about the women. 
And so we went to see my sister in her village. Um, luckily, there was a wedding going on. And so as a result, um, I, there were lots of family were also gathering there. And while I was there, I also met some of my aunties. So these are my mother's sisters. Again, more and more Eritrean. <laughs> um, it's a bit of a dark picture here, but um, this is one of my favourite photographs, simply because by being with my aunties, it was the closest I could get to my mother, basically. Um, and then, of course, there's my sister, Timnit. I have one sister and three brothers. Um, and um, I did have another sister, but she died in the struggle. She was actually the sister that I was told when I arrived that I looked the most like. Um, Timnit is the, the sister here who's the eldest. Um, I initially thought or mistook Timnit for a um, quiet, you know, maybe even downtrodden woman, but I learned very quickly that that was actually not the case. She is very sweet, but she's certainly not quiet and she certainly isn't downtrodden. Um, <laughs> Timnit and I had a huge argument um, not long after this photograph was taken um, because I wanted to, I learned that the, the village near, uh, the village where I was born, is actually very near to where Timnit lives, and I wanted to visit the village, but Timnit didn't want me to visit the village. She thought I wasn't strong enough to make the walk, um, and she was saying to me, what, what's there? There's nothing there. There's only dust and sand. Um, we're your family. We're here. Eventually, we came to a compromise, the compromise being that um, she would send her son with us, and then we would obviously, you know, he'd obviously be able to help out if I couldn't make the walk. So I was eventually allowed to go with my, um, well, my nephew and my brother to the village. So this is the village in the distance. You can see a white dot. The white dot is the church. Um, so that's where we were heading. This is the village where I was born up close. Um, and then we, um, as we were getting nearer and nearer to the village, my brother Madhani very casually said, should we look at the house you were born in? <laughs> Um, bear in mind, this is, you know, 30, year old, 30 years ago in a country that was ravaged by a civil war. I said, well, obviously I'd like to look at the house. I can't believe the house is still there. Um, but he said, it's still there. There are a family, live a different family lives there now. But yes, you can see the house that you were born in. So we go up to see the house. And this is me outside the house where I was born. This is, um, for me the heart of the theme of discovery and rediscovery. When I set out on the journey, I thought that it was all about meeting my family. But actually, I feel like this house was calling me. And because I, this wasn't on the schedule, this wasn't on the plan, and I had to fight in the end to actually get there. Um, and so the fact that I made it to this house without really realizing that that's actually where I was trying to go, for me, is about coming full circle. And it's about discovery and rediscovery in the context of being a diaspora African. As I said with the first slide, when I first got to Eritrea, I thought it was, you know, I've, I've arrived, I belong. Um, and I realized very soon that actually I'm a, I'm a different kind of Eritrean. I'm not an Eritrean who grew up there. I'm a, you know, I, I, I was born there. My early months were there. And that gives me a tie but it's a very different experience. But what it does give me is this identity of being a returnee, which in itself carries its own flag in many ways, and is a very common identity and just as valid. And if you're a returnee, in, in, um, in Eritrea they have a word for it, which is um, a derogatory term. <laughs> um, they talk of them as being belles, which is the prickly pear, and the prickly pear only comes out in August. <laughs> as do the returnees. Um, but I've come to embrace that, and that's fine. Um, and there are different ways of being a returnee. I'm going to close with a very short reading, which is um, just after um, this photo was taken. We went into the house. When my brother has gone, I walk around the sleeping area, touching everything. The walls, the few clay pot storage pots that were on the floor. How old are they? Did she carry them? And then I finally come back to the bed. I run my hand along it, noting how cleverly everything is built into the walls of the hidmo, a solid mass like a waist-high ledge. Double-checking that the other is, others are engrossed in their conversation, I slip off my shoes and lie down. Strange how just a few moments ago I was desperate to leave this room. Now I look around, Seeing what she would have seen, I close my eyes and take a deep breath, 
smell what she would have smelled. And then, keeping my eyes closed, I lie there for a few moments, just listening out for the sounds she would have heard, the chatter of the living area, the chickens outside, the occasional donkey. This is as close to her as I will ever get. Worried about the others walking in on me, I open my eyes and sit up. I sit there for a while longer, not sure what I'm waiting for. And then the tears come. Not forced, not sobs, just a few tears at the sadness of it all. I will never meet my mother. I will never have a photograph of her. But at least now I have something to remember her by. Thank you.